Okay, I come from San Francisco. It's uh, it's not uh, unusual no. to be gay in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so she uh, sent me to a place called Hob de Grasse in Maryland. I was there with a bunch of Jesuit priests. I had three weeks of uh, l finding out why I drank, how I could stop. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I couldn't stay at the hotel. I had to stay uh, at some other place, something. I don't know, I was, I was a little annoyed. Johnny Mathis is a famous singer who has been in the spotlight for many years. Recently, there have been some awful rumors about him. At 88 years old, Johnny decided to speak up and confirm these rumors. As you told Us Magazine, this was the quote, homosexuality is a way of life that I've grown accustomed to, and then that statement was retracted. I mean, obviously, uh, you've got, I think, death. Most people remember him for his beautiful songs like Chances Are and Misty, but there's a lot more to his life than just music. I'm sure you are probably wondering, what surprising details did he reveal, and how these dramatic events shaped his life and relationships? But before we get into these revelations, we need to understand the early events that shaped Johnny Mathias' remarkable journey. Let's get into it. My dad was my best pal, and uh, he also sang, and that's why I sang. And Born on September 30th, 1935, in Gilmer, Texas, Johnny grew up in a large family as the fourth of seven children. His parents, Clem Mathis and Mildred Boyd, worked hard to provide for their family, and they shared their deep love for music with their son. When Johnny was just five years old, his family moved to San Francisco, California in 1940, settling in the Richmond district on 32nd Avenue. This move was the start of Johnny's lifelong love of music. His father, Clem, had experience in vaudeville as a singer and pianist, and he recognized that Johnny had a special talent. Clem believed in Johnny so much that he spent $25, a lot of money back then, on an old upright piano. He taught Johnny how to play, starting with simple songs like My Blue Heaven, this old piano became the foundation of Johnny's music education, where his passion for singing grew stronger each day. My dad had a wonderful, wonderful way about uh, accepting things as they are. Johnny's parents were not just supportive, they were his biggest fans. They even started his fan club, encouraging him every step of the way. Johnny wasn't just a singer, he was also a performer. He danced and performed routines taught by his father for family visitors, at school events, and in church functions. From a young age, it was clear that Johnny had a deep love for entertaining people. When Johnny was 13, a voice teacher named Connie Cox noticed his incredible vocal talent and decided to take him under her wing. She offered to give Johnny singing lessons in exchange for him doing some housework. Over the next six years, Johnny trained hard under her guidance. He learned vocal scales, exercises, and how to control his voice. He also studied classical and opera singing, which later made his singing style unique and different from many other pop singers. Singing his iconic holiday classics. However, he's also known for his unforgettable love songs, and he is back with us today to sing my funny Valentine. Welcome back, Thank our you great very much. friend. Johnny's talent didn't stop at music. He was also an excellent athlete. In high school at George Washington High in San Francisco, he was great at sports like high jumping, hurdling, and basketball. His athletic ability earned him a scholarship to San Francisco State College in 1954. While at college, he continued to impress in sports and set a high jump record of 1.97 meters. This record was so good that it almost matched the Olympic high jump record at the time. Johnny's athletic journey even brought him alongside future NBA legend Bill Russell, and the San Francisco Chronicle featured both of them in a story about their jumping skills. Every time I jump or hurdle, it would uh, give me a great deal of pain. So uh, throughout most of my athletic career, I was in. Despite his success in sports, Johnny's heart was always with music. The big turning point in his music career happened one Sunday afternoon while he was singing at a jam session with a friend's jazz band at the Black Hawk Club in San Francisco. A woman named Helen Noga, who co-owned the club, noticed Johnny's talent right away. She was so impressed by him that she decided to manage his career. She found Johnny a weekend job singing at Andy's 440 Club, where people started noticing his beautiful voice. Agony. So I was looking for an excuse to, you know, to finish with it, and the, the singing came along, and that was kind of nice. Things took a huge step forward in 1955 when Helen Noga heard that George Avakian, 
the head of Columbia Records' popular music department, was vacationing near San Francisco. Helen was determined to get Johnny noticed by Avakian, so she kept calling him to come and hear Johnny sing. After many calls, Avakian finally agreed to visit the 440 Club to see Johnny perform. When Avakian heard Johnny sing, he was amazed. He immediately sent a message to Columbia Records that said, have found a phenomenal 19-year-old boy who could go all the way, send blank contracts. I remember at uh, the age of... Uh... And with that, Johnny Mathis's journey to stardom began. Johnny's first album, Johnny Mathis, a new sound and popular song, was a jazz record, but it didn't sell well. Even though it wasn't a success, Johnny stayed in New York City, performing in nightclubs. He was determined to make it in the music world. This determination paid off when Mitch Miller, a vice president at Columbia Records, took an interest in him. Miller thought Johnny would do well singing soft romantic songs, so he paired him with Ray Conniff, a well-known conductor. This collaboration helped create Johnny's famous sound. In late 1956, Johnny recorded two songs, Wonderful, Wonderful, and It's Not For Me To Say. These songs became instant classics. MGM noticed Johnny's talent and signed him to sing It's Not For Me To Say in the movie Lizzie, 1957. These songs helped define Johnny's style and brought him more fans. June 1956 marked a big moment in Johnny's career. He appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, one of the most popular TV shows at the time. This performance shot his popularity to new heights. That same year, Johnny released his second million-selling single, Chances Are. The song became a huge hit, and Johnny was now a big name in the music industry. It's not for me to say. In November 1957, Johnny released Wild as the Wind, a song featured in the movie of the same name. This song was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. Johnny performed it at the Oscars in March 1958, which further boosted his career. One week before the Oscars, Johnny released an album called Johnny's Greatest Hits. This album made history by staying on the Billboard Top 200 album charts for 490 weeks, almost nine and a half years. Only 15 years later, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon broke that record. Johnny's success continued to grow. You kiss me. However, Johnny's life took a hard turn his beautiful mansion in the Hollywood Hills, a place he had called home for 51 years, was hit by disaster. This wasn't just any house, it was a home full of memories. Johnny had spent over five decades there, making it a personal sanctuary. But on one evening in November, while Johnny was away performing in New York and Cleveland, a terrible fire broke out. Legendary singer Johnny Mathis is dealing with major damage to his beautiful home in the Hollywood Hills after a fire tore through it tonight. A neighbor noticed the fire and quickly reported it. By the time Johnny came back to Los Angeles, it was clear that his home had taken a lot of damage. The fire had destroyed at least two rooms and shattered the glass windows that covered the indoor pool area. When the firefighters arrived, they did their best to put out the fire, but a lot of damage had already been done. For Johnny, seeing his beloved home in ruins was heartbreaking. The rooms he had loved were burnt, debris was scattered everywhere, and the once beautiful indoor pool area was full of broken glass and covered in smoke stains. But in the middle of all the sadness, there was a bright side. Luckily, no one was home at the time, and no one got hurt. If Johnny had been home, he could have been in danger. After the fire, Johnny worked closely with the investigators from the Los Angeles Fire Department. They wanted to understand how the fire had started. The investigation didn't give all the answers right away, but Johnny knew the damage was big. Still, he remained positive. He was thankful that things hadn't been worse, reminding himself that he could have been sleeping in the house when the fire started. Even though the fire had caused a lot of destruction, Johnny felt lucky. He knew his home could be fixed, and he was grateful no lives were lost. But that wasn't the end of Johnny's home troubles. Fast forward to January 2023, and Johnny's house faced another disaster. This time it wasn't fire, but a natural disaster. For nearly two weeks, California had been hit with heavy rains and severe weather. The constant rain soaked the ground, and soon the hillside near Johnny's home gave way. A huge landslide struck Johnny's neighborhood in Hollywood Hills West. 
and once again, his beloved home was in danger. The landslide caused a large part of Johnny's property to slide down the hill. The brick stairway that led up to his house, along with some of his furniture, was scattered down the hillside. It was a chaotic scene. The hill itself had collapsed, sending dirt, debris, and pieces of Johnny's home tumbling down the slope. That's right, a hillside, Ellen, along Sunset Plaza Drive. You're looking live at the 1400 block of Sunset Plaza Drive, where the entire side of that hill has literally moved the terrain. Johnny's home had faced two major disasters. First, the fire in 2015, and now the landslide in 2023. Both events had caused a lot of damage to his property, but Johnny tried to stay hopeful through it all. After the fire, he worked to restore his house and he knew he would have to do the same after the landslide. Despite the devastation, Johnny remained thankful that he was safe and no one was injured in either of the events. For more than 30 years, people have been traveling here to have it a grace for treatment, tackling their addiction, transforming their lives. Johnny also faced personal struggles along the way. One of his biggest challenges was dealing with addiction. His problem started after he lost his voice while performing five shows a night at the famous Copacabana nightclub in New York. Desperate to get better, he went to see Dr. Max Jacobson, who was known for his miracle injections that were supposed to help people recover. Dr. Jacobson's treatments were very popular with celebrities, including the Kennedys and Broadway stars. These injections were supposed to be vitamins, but they were actually full of amphetamines, which are very powerful drugs. The injections helped Johnny's voice recover and gave him energy, but they also introduced him to a new problem, substance abuse. He began to struggle with addiction, and this started to affect his health and career. In addition to the drug problem, Johnny was also drinking heavily. He especially loved champagne and didn't realize just how serious his drinking had become. It wasn't until a well-known figure, Nancy Reagan, noticed his behavior and decided to step in that things began to change. At a reception, she saw how much Johnny was drinking and found out about his deeper struggles. Nancy Reagan made arrangements for Johnny to go to a rehab center in Maryland. The rehab center was run by Jesuit priests and Johnny stayed there for three weeks. During his time there, he was able to understand why he had turned to drinking and learned how to overcome it. This experience became a turning point in his life, helping him find sobriety and refocus on what he loved most, music. After completing rehab, Johnny realized that his addictions were taking him away from his passion for music. With a new determination, he committed to staying sober. This decision not only saved his health, but also allowed him to keep making music without the distractions of addiction. Mathis never stopped helping others. Over the years, he has supported many organizations that work to make a difference in the world. He has been involved with the American Cancer Society, helping to fight cancer, and the March of Dimes, which supports mothers and babies. He also worked with the YWCA and YMCA, both groups that help young people and families. Mathis has supported the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which helps those with muscular diseases, and he has shown his support for the Serenon LACP, a group that fights for equal rights. Johnny Mathias has lived a life full of remarkable experiences at 88. Johnny finally confirms what many have speculated for decades about his personal life and sexuality. Johnny's career has always been under the spotlight, but he managed to keep his private life relatively. Mathis made a statement that surprised many people. In an interview with Us Magazine, he said, Homosexuality is a way of life that I've grown accustomed to. At the time, Mattis wasn't ready for the world to know this about him. The comment was supposed to be off the record, meaning he didn't want it made public, but it was published anyway. For years after that, Mattis didn't talk about his sexual orientation because of the backlash he received. He even got death threats, which made him stay silent on the issue for a long time. In 2006, Mattis opened up again about his sexuality during a podcast interview. He said that part of the reason he didn't talk about it earlier was because of the time he grew up in. The older generation, especially in the entertainment industry, wasn't as open about these things. It was harder to talk about being gay back then. Matisse explained that the death threats and societal pressures made it even more difficult for him to discuss it. Years later in 2017, Johnny Matisse decided it was time to fully share his story. During an interview with CBS News, he talked openly about his life. 
He confirmed that he is gay, explaining that growing up in San Francisco, it wasn't unusual. He said he had both girlfriends and boyfriends, but never got married because he knew he was gay. Now back to his music career. Remember when I earlier mentioned that, at the start of his musical career, he got signed by Helen Noga? Well, that did not end well, because Johnny took a big step in his career by suing his manager, Ray Noga. He wanted to end their business relationship, and this led to a court battle. Noga fought back, but Mathis won. After splitting from Noga, Mathis decided to take more control of his career. He set up his own music and business companies. In May 1967, he started John Matt Records, which was meant to help him produce his own music. He also started Rojon Productions on his 29th birthday, September 30th, 1964. This company was meant to handle his concerts, TV appearances, and charity work. Before all this, Mathis had already created Global Records to release his albums when he was working with Mercury Records. From then on, Ray Hahn became Mathis' manager and business partner until Hahn passed away in 1984. Johnny Mathis has had a long history with Columbia Records, one of the biggest record labels. He started with them in 1956 and stayed with them until 1963. He took a break for four years to work with Mercury Records, but returned to Columbia in 1968 and has been with them ever since. This makes him one of the longest lasting artists on the label, alongside other famous names like Bob Dylan, Barbara Streisand, Tony Bennett, Billy Joel, and Bruce Springsteen. Mathis has had a lot of success over the years. He's had five albums on the Billboard charts at the same time, something only a few other singers like Frank Sinatra and Barry Manilow have done. He's also released 200 singles, with 71 of them charting worldwide. Mathis wasn't just about making music. He made a big impact on TV, too. He's done 12 TV specials of his own and appeared as a guest on more than 300 shows. He even appeared on The Tonight Show 54 times. The famous host, Johnny Carson, once called Mathis the best ballad singer in the world. In 2007, Mathis was invited back on the show, now hosted by Jay Leno, to sing The Shadow of Your Smile. Mathis' music has been heard in more than 100 TV shows and movies around the world. His appearance on Live By Request in 1998 was one of the most watched episodes of the series. In 2014, Johnny Mathis narrated a special documentary called 51 Dons. The film was about the 1951 San Francisco Dons football team, who were denied a chance to play in a bowl game because they refused to exclude their two African-American players. This story was important to Mathis because he was friends with those players, Ali Matson and Burl Toller. Mathias also appeared on TV shows and movies. In the finale of Criminal Minds season 14, he played himself as the best man at David Rossi's wedding. He also played himself in the 2017 movie, Just Getting Started. <laughs> Johnny has another passion that might surprise you, cooking. His love for cooking began when he was just a child, growing up in a family that cared about good food. Even at a young age, Johnny loved helping in the kitchen, learning how to cook and prepare meals. What started as a simple hobby turned into something much more. Cooking became an important part of his life. While Johnny became a music superstar, selling over 350 million records and earning many gold and platinum awards, he never lost his love for the kitchen. Cooking gave him joy and comfort. It became a way for him to relax after a busy day of performing or traveling. Johnny's family and friends have been lucky enough to enjoy his delicious creations, which are always made with love and care. Even with a busy life filled with concerts and charity work, Johnny always makes time to cook. His love for cooking is well known to those close to him. When he's not in the kitchen, another one of his favorite pastimes is golf. Introduced to the game in the 1960s, Johnny quickly fell in love with golf and now plays almost every day when he isn't traveling. Golf helps him stay fit and clear his mind. In fact, Johnny's connection to golf is so strong that he has even sung at big golf events like the Ryder Cup. Johnny's approach to cooking is very detailed. He believes that good meals start with careful planning. He always knows what he wants to cook, even after a long day of playing golf or performing. This planning helps him make sure he always has a tasty meal, no matter how busy he is. Johnny's kitchen is proof of his passion for food. He has a whole room full of cookbooks from all over the world. 
He's always adding new books to his collection, and every two years, he donates some of them to local schools. He believes it's important to share knowledge and inspire others to cook. Johnny believes that cooking is a lot like performing music. Just like you need to prepare for a concert, you also need to prepare when making a meal. Even when Johnny's on the road, he tries to cook whenever he can. Hotels with full kitchens are his favorite because they let him cook his own meals. When he can't cook, he chooses simple but healthy meals that give him the energy he needs to perform. Red meat and vegetables are his go-to foods because they help him stay strong for his shows. And now to sing the second nominated song, The Last Time I Felt Like This, from the motion picture same time next year. Here are Johnny Mathis and... Johnny would always be one of the most celebrated singers in America. His talent has earned him many awards throughout his long career. In 2003, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. This award honors performers who have made significant contributions to music, and three of his songs are in the Grammy Hall of Fame. He was honored for Chances Are in 1998, Misty in 2002, and It's Not For Me To Say in 2008. These songs showcase his unique style and are beloved by many fans. On June 21, 2014, Mathesis was inducted into the Great American Songbook Hall of Fame. This special honor celebrates artists who have helped shape American music. Other inductees that year included Linda Ronstadt and Nat King Cole. Mathis's voice has played a big part in creating America's musical history. His achievements don't stop there. On June 1, 1972, Mathis received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, recognizing his contributions to music. He also performed at the Academy Awards twice. In 1978, his song, The Last Time I Felt Like This, a duet with Jane Oliver, was nominated for an Oscar. Matisse has received many other awards too, like the Society of Singers Lifetime Achievement Award in 2006. He even earned an honorary Doctor of Fine Arts degree from San Francisco State University in 2017. This was special because he had attended the school before focusing on his music career. Johnny Mathis's journey is a true inspiration for many aspiring musicians.